So I'm the biologist and science program manager at Return to Freedom, um, which is headquartered in Lompoc, California. It's in Santa Barbara County. I also sit on the Wild Horse and Burrow Advisory Board meeting, which I was joking yesterday is like career suicide. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, a little bit about Return to Freedom. Um, the nonprofit was established in 1997 um, to provide for the welfare and sanctuary of the horses and burros that live there, um, and obviously that live there, and to educate about the natural history of horses and burros and the management challenges of wild horses and burros on public lands. Um, but also, importantly, um, instructing the public in responsible advocacy and how to be involved with their public lands management. Um, because we're a closed system at the sanctuary, this is why I as a scientist enjoy the ability to work in this closed system, um, we can capture data pretty readily. We can run horses through chutes, I can catch blood and take um, samples, and so we have really good rich data about our fertility control program there at the sanctuary because we know all the horses and we can, we can get things from them. We've, um, we've been managing our horse herds um, both at the headquarter facility and at our satellite um, facilities up and down throughout California um, since 1999. So one of the early projects in utilizing PZP, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later for fertility control. Um, um, the current wild horse management in North America, I think as everybody here knows, is a little bit wacky. Um, <laughs> we have wild horses in 10 Western United States. Um, horses started in what is now North America 55 million years ago. They, they finished, they didn't finish, they went through their, a lot of their evolutionary history here um, and then disappeared 10 to 12,000 years ago when that Bering Land Bridge, which had allowed for them to go back and forth, and there's going to be some papers coming out really soon about that back and forth movement out of UC Santa Cruz. Um, the papers are going to come out. The horses didn't move in and out of UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so that, that's, uh, to me, that just sort of richens their history, um, and of course it will reopen that debate about native and reintroduced and feral and all of that good stuff that humans like to wrap their brains around. Um, but they did disappear 10 to 12,000 years ago, probably uh, mostly because of climate and potentially because of some hunting. Um, but they returned to North, or what is now North America, um, with the Spanish explorers in the early 1500s. Um, and so we call these horses that have sort of descended from that and also from then the European explorers who were bringing those horses as well. And so these different types of breeds are intermixing out on the North American plains and um, horses reproduce quite readily and quite easily. And so they're spreading all over the place and mixing up their backgrounds. Mustang is not a breed, it just means horse without a home from the Spanish word mustaño. Um, so that's how and why they're here. And then um, in, in the late 50s, actually, Velma Johnson, who we all know as Wild Horse Annie, followed a truck with blood dripping out of the back of it. She was curious as to what the heck was going on. Followed the truck. It was going to a slaughter facility, and there were horse, horses inside of that truck. And it just made her wonder, where are these horses from? Who has the jurisdiction over these horses? And who gets to make the decision that it's okay to send them to slaughter? She began digging in, found out these were just horses out on public and private lands that um, Mustangers could go out and capture for any use or purpose, for utilizing for ranch stock, for selling for slaughter, for culling whatever they needed or wanted to do. And she felt that they deserved to be protected. Um, so after lots of campaigning and lots of people involved and more letters written, uh, to Congress than any other issue except for the Vietnam War. In 1971, the Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act was passed. Um, Dr. J. Kirkpatrick's um, thoughts about that act are expressed below. Um, we oftentimes have well intentions. Projecting what will happen down the line is a little difficult for us. Um, Wild horse and burrow management is not easy. Uh, so the act mandated that the Bureau of Land Management was going to have primary responsibility for those animals on public lands. But there are obviously horses not just on BLM land. We have horses on Forest Service, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. We have horses on Native American lands. We have horses in private um, holdings that people would like for them to exit those private holdings. Um, and the BLM, I know you guys will find this, uh, you know, Hard to believe, but the BLM and these other federal entities don't always play nice together. Um, so while the BLM has the major jurisdiction, 
and has been mandated to then work with your neighbors and your partners to figure it out on Forest Service land or National Parks land, that doesn't always occur very well. So I like to think of BLM as sort of the battleship in terms of wild horse and burrow management. They have a lot of the resources, a lot of the experience, and sort of are guiding the effort. Um, and then these little guys on the side in their tinier, I don't know, rowboats are really trying to catch up and they don't really have the resources that they need. Um, I think we're all aware of how those horses are managed on public lands. Uh, BLM is going to look at what is occurring on those lands, what the carrying capacity is, what are the other uses, because of course BLM is a multi-use mandated federal agency, so it's not just horses or just cattle that are out on those lands. There's a few other things happening as well, mining, logging, recreation, um, et cetera. Um, so, um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, they, have to, they have to manage for all of that and determine what are the number of horses, in this case, can be sustained in that area. That's their appropriate management level, or AML. Once that has been determined, then when horses rise above that AML, this system kicks into play. So if there's 500 horses out there, but there's supposed to be 100, 400 are considered excess, they are gathered and removed, put into short-term holding initially and available for adoption, they don't get adopted or they're not deemed adoptable, they go into long-term holding for the rest of their life. Um, that adoption program, while it began pretty strong, our horse market is pretty saturated and adopting out a wild horse is not necessarily easy to begin with. So obviously adoptions are not keeping up with the number of horses removed from the range. Um, this goes round and round. If you remove those 400 horses and okay, great, we're down to 100 and that land can sustain that, perfect but three to five years later, you're back up to close to that 400, so we kick it in again. This, uh, this graph shows exactly that idea that um, if we're going to go and put horses into holding, it's gonna cost money. So as that line goes up across the bottom, we have total, total numbers in short and long-term holding, and then across the y-axis, we have the budget allocation in millions of dollars, Obviously, as your holding goes up, your cost of caring for those animals also goes up. Um, and this slide shows that the percent budget allocated for fertility control um, per year, that's the gray bars, plotted alongside the number of horses and burrows on the range, the black dots. Uh, we can see that though fertility control is a valuable tool in terms of managing populations, the BLM has never implemented it at a level that will achieve anything. Um, so, and, and that's not to fault the BLM, the, the money available, uh, there isn't money available because the money is going towards caring for horses in short and long-term holding. Um, so today with the number of horses on the range estimated to be on BLM lands only, about 88,000 horses and a national appropriate management level of about 27,000 horses. Um, the, the ease of implementation of fertility control has now gotten quite difficult, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but first I wanna back up and talk about fertility control a little bit. Um, in the 70s and 80s, real thought went into, um, into fertility control for wildlife. Uh, conservation biologists and researchers and reproductive physiologists were beginning to gather at um, conferences to discuss just this and to develop parameters that were going to be considered appropriate and ethical and reasonable for whatever tools, um, vaccines, methods were being looked into for wildlife, uh, for wildlife fertility control. And these were sort of the the deemed as ethical and we need to sort of capture within whatever tools we're utilizing for that wildlife fertility control. Um, and then, sorry, I won't go into every single point here, don't worry. Um, but in the early 70s, research was showing that zona pellucida proteins, those proteins that surround all mammalian eggs, um, could be, um, there could be an immune response induced to basically render those proteins ineffective. So when the sperm hits that egg coating, that exchange of genetic material and fertilization is not going to occur. So behaviors remain the same. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing happening to the endocrine system, which is important uh, uh, in terms of behavior potentially. Um, so it's an elegant method. Um, and then, um, 
there was the research that began in horses in particular, the early research at UC Davis with Erwin Liu looking at whether ZP proteins could be utilized to uh, contracept domestic mares. And then that work done by the early pioneers, John Turner, J. Kirkpatrick, and Erwin Liu on wild horse herds um, to see if they could effectively utilize ZP proteins and if they could deliver it remotely because to horses, getting a dart with a vaccine into it is going to be a challenge. Um, so all that early work was going on and then that um, Zona pellucida type vaccines began to be used in many, many animals, um, including deer and elk and elephants, um, of which we'll hear about some of that today. Um, there are other, not, there's not just PZP available for wildlife fertility control. I'm, again, I'm not gonna go into great detail because I wanna go into some great detail about something else. Um, but the early days were steroid related vaccines um, to try to reduce sperm counts um, or stop that, um, um, I can't think of how to say that. Steroid related vaccines were in the early days, but some of the challenges of those vaccines are feasibility, logistics, cost, and safety. So this was Jay Kirkpatrick and John Turner hanging out of helicopters to anesthetize stallions out on the range, jumping out of the helicopters and giving giant syringes full of thick steroid into the muscle. And you know, n none of that is gonna work well. Uh, I mean, it might work, but being able to actually use it to manage wildlife is just never going to be, you're, you're never going to get down the line with that. Um, so that was sort of, that's sort of off the books right now in terms of what we might utilize for wildlife fertility control. The contraceptive vaccines, these ZP protein vaccines that elicit an immune response are sort of, were sort of the next wave, and a lot of those are, are being used right now today. We also have the gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists. In other words, we're going to stop that hormone cascade from happening, so a, a mare or whatever animal you're targeting cannot get pregnant. Um, a few of those are being um, researched right now further. Um, and then we also have spay and neuter capacity, um, and we'll get into why that upsets people in a second. Um, the, <laughs> the BLM is currently pursuing alongside universities and the Humane Society um, a lot of different approaches. They are very aware that they need to look for longer acting or permanent methods that are relatively easy to apply. Um, so that is actually occurring. We hear a lot of complaints that um, the BLM isn't implementing fertility control, and that is true, I would say. Um, they are not terribly good at discovering from their research what's applicable and then actually applying it. Um, however, there's a lot of exciting research happening right now, and that will be a game changer down the line. Um, a few things that are worth mentioning are the development right now with USGS of a population modeling program that will actually take into account the ability to layer in fertility control and cost. That's new. So managers will have a tool soon to better analyze the possibilities. Um, right now, there have been two attempts, maybe three, by the BLM to do some spay research on mares. It, it elicits a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty big response um, in terms of not a lot of support from the public for that level of manipulation on horses, which are federally protected and beloved. Um, so that is not getting off the ground. I have to argue it from a sort of logistics standpoint that it does not seem to me a terribly feasible option. It is expensive. Wild mares in a shoot then recovering after a procedure is weird. Um, <laughs> I gotta say, it, it's not their greatest idea. Um, but now we get to the, the nut of the matter here in my last five minutes. <laughs> um, can fertility control save the day? Um, and the chart that you can't probably see at the bottom of the slide, there's three things about it that are important. Um, and I need to read this so I don't miss it. Um, when we look at the annual budget allocation, which increases every year for the Wild Horse and Burrow Program, the tiny number of horses treated with any sort of fertility control and the fraction of the budget available to spend on fertility control, we learn that one, gather, remove as the management paradigm accomplishes nothing. Numbers on the range are continuing to grow. Two, fertility control doesn't work when it's not applied. That's, kind of <laughs> <laughs> That's my big take-home message here. 
Um, and three, populations continue to grow unless and until you address reproduction. Um, so we're trying to do that right now, and we're getting hammered for it. Um, the system is broken. It's no one's fault. Um, I mean, there are so many layers to this highly contentious story. Um, and we like to blame each other, but it's really no one's fault. It's, it's too many variables to count. Opposing sides have clashed for years. We have this sort of stereotypical cattle versus wild horses, but then we have a lot of other layers on top of that. We have all failed miserably. Um, with this in mind, about three and a half years ago, the Humane Society began initiating a series of stakeholder meetings out west to bring together some of these contentious and clashing sides. Um, and, and I gotta say, it has not been easy, but it's been pretty amazing. And especially being here at this conference and learning about systems-based approaches, um, we, we sort of accidentally are getting there. And now that I realize there's a method, I'm like, oh, we might be able to clean up our messiness in this approach. Um, and this is a messy process. Um, everyone has their opinions, but we have decided to set a lot of them aside to find the common ground that exists and just to operate from there. Um, the early challenges, of course, are who to invite, who do you bring into these stakeholder meetings. You definitely have fringe groups that do have valid concerns and bring a lot to the table, but by them being at the table, there's no advancement in the discussion. Um, so we did start small and we invited a lot of people. Not everyone wanted to be involved because it clashes with messaging. If you're, if you're holding a line that things should be this way and you're meeting with a group that's basically going to compromise that view, it is dangerous for you to be involved. Um, we're certainly seeing that as a small nonprofit. It's very difficult to be involved in this process and make it clear to people what is going on without sort of a, a paranoid layer thinking that we've been sort of bought off by the dark side, which is funny to me because I'm like, well, the welfare groups started it. Um, anyway, um, as the meetings progressed, we actually found more common ground than we thought. <laughs> Big surprise, right? Um, we all want healthy horses on healthy rangelands, and that's going to mean a paradigm shift in terms of management. Um, so we learned a thing or two actually listening to each other, I got to say. There were things I didn't know, believe it or not. Um, and so it's been humbling as well. Um, and we knew, we knew that we wanted to, the welfare groups were interested in digging into a non-lethal approach. We've sort of been asking for it, but had we really actually plugged and chugged the numbers and seen if it was achievable? Um, and so that's where I started to get involved. Um, is beginning to lay those numbers out and look at something that was going to be a little hard to swallow. But what we found was heartening. Um, the, the yellow line is fertility control only. If we just applied fertility control, um, scaling it up out there on the range, we can't get there. The number of foals born each year is far outpacing what we would be able to handle. And, and we, were, we were being a little conservative in our, our approach, but we were trying to be what's actually feasible. Um, the green line represents business as usual, so just continuing to gather remove at approximately 10 to 12,000 horses a year and no other management. And those numbers just, again, you're not keeping up with your full crop every year, so those numbers continue to rise. The only way to stabilize populations and then begin to drop them is a combination of those management tools. So we do have to gather and remove, but alongside of that, we have to scale up fertility control. The modeling that we did, again, is just modeling. It's a basic idea of what we can achieve and the costs behind it. And again, our cost analysis, which we did have economists help us to do, are gonna be rough. We, we got our, all of our information from peer-reviewed journal data and from talking to the agencies, many, many meetings. Um, and it is more efficient cost-wise than what is happening now. Um, so, so that's good because that gives us a platform to approach Congress and to say, if you want sustainable management of wild horses and burros on public lands, it is a high cost initially but then that cost begins to scale down. That doesn't happen with business as usual. Um, but again, the agency needs to do that internally to discover that. Um, so the big picture 
to this graph is that fertility control is part of the solution. It can't work by itself. We've got to combine methods. We can do it non-lethally, which right now is um, the environment within which we live. That is what people want. Um, that is what Congress wants. Um, so we're going to try and see if we can get there. But that window is closing. Um, I'm almost done. This is just a slide of pretty pictures. Um, armed with the knowledge and more importantly, the relative standard messaging and requests coming to Congress and the agency from a group that consists of people like the Cattlemen's Association, Utah Governor's Office, the ASPCA, the Humane Society, and a nonprofit called Return to Freedom, that is what's new and different. Congress is beginning to listen. This is a very diverse stakeholder group. Um, and so our ability to do that has been given more credence. And so we're actually sort of excited by things that are happening right now. Um, finally, I have to put in my, my, my downer slide, um, which is that we've reached a point where time is not on our side at all. Um, un and unfortunately, implementation of fertility control is slow. Um, the consequences of climate change to Western rangelands are and will be alterations of forage quantity and quality, overall changes to plant community composition, and decreases in precipitation in an already semi-arid to, to arid land. Um, that's not, um, sorry. Whether you run cattle on those lands, or you want to see sage grouse on those lands, or you want to see wild horses and burrows on those lands maintained on land that can handle them, um, that's what matters. Um, that climate change and what's happening to those western lands um, are going to, that's a filter through which we have to, to manage a lot of things differently at this point. Um, and without programmatic implementation of fertility control, none of that balance can happen. Um, and that is that. I think I'm out of time, but I do want to show you guys that our stakeholder group was on the front page of the Washington Post last week. So this is my show and tell. You can read about the contentiousness and who hates this plan. Um, <laughs> in the article, which I will have with me.